to kick off, um, we felt it would be useful to review uh, the, con the labour market in context of today's discussion. You know, there's an ever increasing demand and business case uh, for diverse talent, yet we're in one of the most competitive markets that we've been in for years. So uh, there's a clear tension there. So I want to talk initially briefly about where we are in terms of the market. So currently, record number of job vacancies in February 2022. We don't, we uh, at Morgan Hunt don't see that abating anytime soon. And I think last count, it was something like 1.25 million vacancies in the UK currently, uh, which is uh, at record levels, as I said. Um, the, we're seeing the sharpest increase in permanent placements on record. So this data comes from KPMG and REC uh, do a UK jobs report on a monthly basis, and they have been doing that for the past 15 years or so. And that's a monthly survey on the UK labour market. Um, so that's the backdrop, and that's where these, these statistics are coming from in terms of what's going on. And so that, that growing demand for staff continues to hold close to a pretty much an all-time record high um, uh, and that, that we're seeing that across the board. The On top of that, the availability of candidates is continuing to fall at an unprecedented rate. So we have record employment and record low unemployment. So that in itself is squeezing uh, the availability of candidates. And I'm sure many of you as hirers are experiencing this right now. And on top of that, we're starting to see, um, you know, demands for increasing, increasing pay demands. We're all aware of the cost of living crisis coming our way that we're currently living through. And, you know, who knows what the next 12 months is, is going to, to be like. I mean, all we've become used to right now is being used to the unexpected, really. But those, those trends are continuing. I think there's another few things I'd like to point out. You know, there's things that have happened post uh, during the pandemic that we're still um, experiencing. So something like over 200,000 over 50s left the UK workforce since the start of the pandemic. And there's also evidence that high numbers of working mothers left the labour market and those are yet to return. So on top of um, you know, everything else, those are other trends that are affecting the availability of candidates. So all of this results really in massive competition for candidates that we're certainly experiencing. And I'm sure you as hirers out there are experiencing as well. So um, in that backdrop, it's my pleasure uh, to first of all, introduce you to James Fellows. Hello, James. Morning, Claire. Thank you so much for having me. Much appreciated. Not at all. Would you like to tell us a little bit about yourself, James? Uh, yeah, my name is James Fellows, um, and I am the founder of the Bridge of Hope Careers, uh, and I was born lucky. Thank you, James. Um, and Chance, hello. Good morning. I think you're on mute still, Chance. You might want to unmute your microphone. Or... <laughs> hi, Would you like hi to do everyone. A brief intro? Yes, hi, everyone. Um, and thank you for having me, Claire. Um, um, so my name is Chance Blue Montgomery. I'm the partner support manager for Bridge of Hope. And I was born unlucky. Thank you, Chance. So um, I think you've both got some really interesting stories I've that I've heard. And I would really like to share that with our, our audience today because I think they're very, very relevant to our discussion this morning. But before we go into a little bit more detail about both of you, um, James, can you tell us a little bit more about your organisation, Bridge of Hope Careers, and what makes it so different? Absolutely. Uh, well, we're part of a social impact business. So the parent organization is called Prosper 4 Group. Uh, and our claim to fame, um, if you can call it that, is that the majority of us uh, have been locked up. Uh, and in my case, uh, that's in a psychiatric ward in just outside New York. And Chance? And in my case, um, in a prison in Brixton and a mental hospital in Hackney. So, yeah, probably not your average company. Uh, <laughs> Uh, and we operate uh, an inclusive talent portal uh, called Bridge of Hope Careers, which you're going to hear a little bit more about later down the line. Uh, very top line, uh, Bridge of Hope Careers bridges the gap effectively between charities, social enterprises uh, and non-Russell group universities who've got incredible 
untapped talent needing a job and inclusive and progressive employers who are looking to exp expand their talent pool and to become more diverse and inclusive. Thank you, James. So as you say, we will talk a little bit more about that later. But James, you mentioned you were born lucky and you've given us a little bit of an insight to your story. So we, could you kind of elaborate on that a little bit more, please? Um, absolutely. So I, I think probably lucky is a bit of an understatement. I was born um, incredibly lucky. Uh, brought up in Newmarket. Uh, I had an idyllic childhood, uh, a, a hugely loving family. Um, and then I was privileged enough to be sent away to a, a boys boarding school. And age 13, I went uh, to the world's um, most famous school, actually. Uh, you've probably heard of it. Uh, yep, that one. Um, and I was in the same class and gambling ring, actually, as a boy called Cameron, who went on to run the country. And a couple of years below this enormous uh, boy with white hair that walked around looking like a polar bear. Um, I never caught his last name, but apparently everybody called him Boris. Uh, and he went on to make um, quite interesting decisions in life. <laughs> Um, so um, I went from um, Eton through um, Edinburgh University and then went into the corporate world um, where I was in the drinks industry, effectively, um, initially for 10 years with Pat Bass, who were the biggest pub retailer in the world at the time. And then I joined Guinness, uh, which became part of Diageo, uh, a leading premium drinks company. Um, and I got posted out in 2002, posted to the US uh, and was running most of the biggest customers uh, in North America for Diageo. Uh, I, by that stage, I was married. I had three kids uh, living in a large house. Um, and by 2008, you know, everything was pretty bloody fantastic. Um, you know, what could possibly go wrong? OK, so on on that point, um, I'd like to go back to you, Chance, because um, that does sound pretty idyllic, James. And it sounds like you were on a, a really uh, strong trajectory. But Chance, unlike James, you said you were born unlucky. So can you tell us? Some of the incredible challenges that you've faced over the course of your your life yeah absolutely so so i i, I was un, unlike james I, I was born into a family where my, my dad didn't think i was his and so i was off to a fantastic start um and um unfortunately i i experienced a lot of physical abuse the first being before i was one year old which left me with what i thought were birthmarks since i was 21 and so i didn't feel significant at home at all um and so i left my family house um i met some friends uh, they made me feel significant but the byproduct of that was that they was from the anti-social membership and it was only going to be a matter of time before i got myself into trouble and i did and uh by the time I was uh, 16, I ended up in prison. By the time I was 18, my sister took me to a mental hospital because the trauma um, and depression just got too much for me. And uh, so this went on. I was chasing my tail somewhat, trying to make some changes, um, but struggling a, a bit. And then fast forward, my sister, who was my rock, died of cancer. And uh, I didn't want to talk about it because then that would make it real, um, which was the worst thing you could possibly do, because within a year, my life unraveled and I ended up back in prison one last time. OK, th thank you, Chance. So coming back to you, James, um, you mentioned, you know, things were going, sounds like quite well up until about 2008. So can you talk us through what happened to you next? Yeah, so um, up to 2008, I really couldn't have been luckier if I tried. Uh, and then, um, well, frankly, the luck ran out uh, in a pretty spectacular way. Uh, so I got laid off uh, during the, the big crash, 2008. Uh, and then um, anything that could go wrong, frankly, did go wrong. Um, and I got um, swindled um, twice. Um, all my money was cleaned, uh, was taken away from me, all our savings. Um, I was sued uh, and my business was taken away when I started my own startup business. And then a whole bunch of other horror stories all happened at once, including property crashes and various other things. Uh, and it was a bit of a, a kind of noose just kept on tightening around the neck over five or six years um, and all the funds drained. Um, and I got to this day um, and I had to go and basically buy uh, food for my family. I had uh, five people in our family and my the only budget that I could get for the weekly shop um, was five dollars and forty one cents. Uh, I basically burned through all the credit cards. I couldn't get any access to anything else. And I had to decide 
was I going to feed my family with a box of cereal and some um, milk uh, or some bread and Nutella? Um, and that was a, a trigger. I mean, I think everybody realizes we're all hard hardwired to feed your your children. And when you can't, well, in my case, the wiring come came loose. Um, and so it, it unraveled pretty quickly. I wasn't really able to operate uh, anymore. I couldn't even turn on the television. Um, and I lost two and a half stone in the space of a month. Uh, and so I was taken to to see a specialist, um, a psychiatric uh, in a psychiatric ward, and they they turned around and um, said that I was to be sectioned uh, for the foreseeable future, uh, which was um, sort of doubly scary. Uh, first of all, the section bit, uh, and then the foreseeable future was even worse, really, because I thought he meant for life. Um, the next thing I know, um, I'm told to sit down in a wheelchair uh, with uh, handcuffs around my wrists, and I'm taken up to the psychiatric ward, um, which is a pretty scary place, as you can imagine. Um, and although it, on the outside, it looks a bit like um, a normal hospital ward, uh, apart from the front door, uh, which is reinforced with uh, plated steel. Um, and there are no shower curtains and no curtains uh, in the place. And it took me a couple of days to work out why that was. Um, and also, and uh, you know, the windows were very, very strong as well. We were on the sixth floor. And the reason I know the windows were very strong was because one of my fellow inmates tried to jump out of that window and bounce back again. Um, so um, it was all pretty hideous. And after uh, a couple of weeks, um, my brother and uncle came out to America and made an intervention. And they said, look, we're going to take him back to the UK, see if he can recover with his mother um, and we'll take it from there. So that was all agreed. I didn't have a vote, came back to the UK. Uh, and it was pretty clear that unfortunately, you know, everything unraveled. My, my, my marriage uh, was gone. My access, my kids were gone. My obviously my job, my home. Pretty well, the whole stack of cards uh, had gone in the space of a few weeks, uh, and my kind of consolation prize was um, a diagnosis of bipolar. Um, and so, I tried to get a job, and suddenly I'd gone from senior executive to officially unemployable. Nobody would touch me with a barge pole. I couldn't get a job in a coffee shop or a pub. Uh, the only place who would give me uh, employment was a frozen food factory um, as the janitor, and they didn't have CVs or care less what mental health condition you got as long as you were prepared to get into a minus 55 degrees frozen food factory. Um, so I did that for a year, clawed my way back into corporate, um, and then I was made redundant one more time. Uh, and that was when I had my you know, epiphany moment, call it what you will. Um, and it was like, it was like, okay, do you wanna keep on flogging legal drugs for the rest of your life or are you actually gonna do something meaningful? Uh, and so I decided it was going to be the latter. And I wasn't sure what uh, exactly, but I knew a job was gonna be central. Um, because I'd had this, you know, my personal experience had been very, very linear. When I'd had a job, life was amazing. And when when I didn't, it was beyond rubbish. Um, and so um, I, that's kind of the, the, the initial thinking there. Um, and would you like me to just explain how that evolved or hold fire? Yeah, why not, James? I okay. think, yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah, so, uh, in essence, so I was trying to find an idea, an opportunity, really, uh, in the sort of social space through the lens of employability. And so I, I rang up a lot of charities who looked after people uh, and they may have been looking after people who had been, you know, former military or ex-offenders or homeless or refugees, didn't really matter. And I was trying to understand the model and, and, and it found out they, they all had exactly the same model. And the model was we take people, they've had a bit of a rubbish time, we rehabilitate them. And the end game, every single one was we get them job ready or we get them work ready. And I'm like, well, fantastic. What do you do after that? And the answer every single time was, we don't. Um, and I'm like, after 35 conversations the same way, I was like, this is crazy. So I said to them, look, if you, if you could get them job ready, how about if we could get them a job? And all 35 said, well, that would be amazing. <laughs> um, why is nobody else doing this? And I'm like, I don't know, I'm just a beer salesman, but there's a bit of an opportunity. And there's clearly a missing link um, between this amazing group, particularly if they're supported by charities and social enterprises, and employers who need more people. And that was even three years ago. Um, and so hence the idea of the Bridge of Hope to connect the two, the charities with the talent uh, or the social enterprises with the talent to the employers who need the talent. Great. Thank you, James. Um, and Chance, just to kind of pick up on your story, um, we left it, you know, you were at obviously rock bottom, but you were decided you needed to turn your life around and you really wanted to focus on helping other people. So how did you meet James and, and end up getting involved in Bridge of Hope careers? Yes. Yeah, so, well, 
my, my story sort of continued when you know our sister passed away i took a serious slide ended up um, back inside and um i sat down and i asked myself this question i said do you like who you are and the answer was worse than no i'd had enough um i didn't really want to live on i thought if this was going to be my life i didn't see any point in having having it and um and so i was left with these choices and the choices was either to not live or change and so i threw everything and the kitchen sink and the neighbor's kitchen sink at change and i spent three years and ten months um in in therapy to just unlock some pain and so there was some of the childhood traumas and spent five years studying with the open university to give myself an education my childhood didn't afford to me and done swathes of personal development programs and then this really incredible day came uh, clear where I was just filled with ebullience and I just started crying these warm tears of joy um, and it was because for the first time after all of that personal development for the first time in my entire life I felt freedom no more emotional discombobulation no more anger um, I was filled with forgiveness and, and most importantly, I was topped to the brim with self-respect. And I realized two things had happened. And uh, one, my childhood experiences were no longer going to define my future. And the second thing was I'd finally become the person I was always meant to be. And that was the day that I decided whatever work I'm doing, I want it to be supporting other people, nourishing um, communities and so forth. And so I went on to um, mentor um, very successfully young men who'd come into contact with the criminal justice system. And um, I, 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 I was fortunate enough to um, have been supported by um, a couple of the uh, charity partners who we work with now, one being Key for Life. Um, who helps move some equine therapy and, and was able to unlock some more pain there and bounce back, who helps me with some uh, of my entrepreneurial endeavors. And so um, bounce back, uh, Frank from Bounce introduced me to James and um, and it was it was brilliant. James was a, a bit of a mentor. He stuck by me and after a while he recognized that some of my sort of skills and qualities and said, hey, why don't you come over and join me on Bridge of Hope? And so I said, yeah, why not? Let's have a look. And when I had a look, um, it was like for me an invitation to heaven because now I was in a position to help not only um, returning citizens from prison or people who's come to contact the criminal justice system, but I could now help veterans women returners, people with neurodiversities, you know, disabilities, like across the board. Um, so this was fantastic for, for me, you know, because, you know, like I said, I dedicate my life now to supporting other people. So this was absolutely fantastic. And so that's how I'm, I met James. Great. <laughs> Thank you, Chance. Um, so James, I mean, that both your stories are really uh, interesting and inspirational in, in, in different ways. Um, but can you tell us a little bit more about Bridge of Hope Careers? Um, you know, it's a unique talent pool. You, you've referenced that both of you already now. But where do where do those where does that talent where do those candidates um, come from, and and what makes it so unique? Uh, yeah, no, absolutely. So uh, I probably just give a little bit more context to where we where we were when. I had the kind of aha moment of this bridge of hope to actually how do we create the portal, uh, which was a couple of years. So um, once we once I had the idea, we, well, we had the, the the general idea. I thought, well, I better do some research to actually see if there's actually any substance to this because it looks like a good idea, but I haven't frankly a clue what I'm talking about. Uh, and I and I um, talked to the uh, BITC business in the community and checked out CIPD and various other organisations. And um, there's been a lot of research around this group of people, what we call untapped talent, um, you know, or you could call it marginalized people. We prefer to be more positive. Um, and it's really interesting. The research proved, uh, and it looked at all the different metrics that a hiring manager um, would be looking for. And on pretty well every metric, the untapped talent um, trounced um, the, the normal talent. They worked harder, they stayed longer. And, you know, they're even, you know, great for your reputation and Timson being an obvious example of that. And, you know, we're thrilled to have them as one of our partners. Um, so, 
you know, it was like, okay, well, we've got something here. Not only is it, you know, there's clearly a missing, but also there's some research to prove this works. Um, but we had to pilot somewhere. So, you know, I came from Newmarket and anyway, we, we decided to pilot in horse racing and the, the concept worked great. And we worked with a bunch of charities like the Prince's Trust, quite a few care leaving tra charities. And we put people th through training into work for studs and stables. Um, but the honest answer was it was quite expensive and it was very analog and it wasn't very scalable. Um, and during my journey, and we were at that stage part of a sort of charity, I met a chap called Michael um, and he'd made my career crash look quite dull. He'd been a partner at Deloitte, then he joined a Nigerian bank, uh, and then he spent two years regretting that in Brixton. And when he came out, he was unemployable. And so he actually set up our social business, um, Prosper 4, way before I was involved. But it was just helping ex-offenders, or we prefer to call them returning citizens, get into work. And so he did that for five or six years. He created a job board, put five or six hundred into work. And so when 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 COVID happened, um, which I'm sure we all remember dearly, those early days in March, it was deeply scary. And we had two ideas, um, which, you know, we hit a massive financial uh, roadblock um, and we were frankly going to go bust very quickly on both if we didn't change. Uh, and so we were like, OK, well, hold on a second. My, my idea is actually um, the, the inclusive idea has got a ton of merit. Um, But how do we? But it's very kind of analog. And his uh, platform was great, but it just didn't make any money. It wasn't commercial because nobody was prepared to pay to hire ex-offenders. So we said, well, let's put the two together. Let's make it fully inclusive. You use the digital platform and the expertise we've already got of running that. And we created the Bridge of Hope. So uh, Bridge of Hope Careers. So that was November, whatever, 16 months ago. I then went back to the original charities and said, look, we're not just messing around with horse racing. You could put people into work, all sorts of places. They could go into retail. They could go into the army. They could go into logistics. Doesn't matter. Um, and they're like, great. And, and I said, and it's free to you and it's free to your candidates. But there are three conditions. Um, and the three conditions are that they have to be job ready talent. You know, their words, not ours. So I said, we don't and nor do our employers do rehabilitation. Secondly, they've got to be good people. If they've had a tumble, we want to help them. If they're a jerk, we don't. And finally, if they need help, um, and so maybe they're neurodiverse or they may have disability or, or uh, you know, whatever condition it might be, uh, any duty of care is down to the charity, the referring partner. They're the experts. We're just the bridge, the conduit. And they all agreed. Um, and so we now have about 100 uh, charities that feed into this platform, charities and social enterprises. So to give you an idea of some example names would include Walking with the Wounded, St. Mungo's, Crisis, um, you know, and we've quite a few refugee charities now, a whole bunch of ex-offender charities. So, you know, really across the board. And we're always looking to expand that. Um, and then we work with about two dozen non-Russell group unis, very, you know, typically very diverse talent pool, great skills, digital design, you name it, but lacking one thing, which is what I was privileged enough to have, which is access or a network. Um, and so you aggregate that together, that'll plus people who walk in. So they might see what we do and they go, well, look, I have a barrier to entry. I'm a mum returning to work or I, you know, whatever it might be. Um, and all, all are welcome. And hence why we, you know, we've grown so quickly. We kind of hoped we might have four or five thousand by now and we've got 75,000, which has gone crazy. Um, and so, you know, and I think Chance will be able to articulate this better. The, you know, the key thing we think that this talent pool Uh, this pool of talent has is resilience uh, and grit, you know, and there's a ton of research that's been done saying, actually, you know, the one thing that matters more than anything, far more than qualifications, track record, etc., is grit. Um, and, um, you know, so we've got resilience and grit and loyalty is the other factor. Somebody gives you an opportunity when you don't think you're going to get another chance. You're not going to turn around and take the next job two minutes later because they're paying you an extra pound an hour. Um, so that probably tries to hopefully describes a little bit about our talent pool. Yeah. And just a, a quick one, because I've had a question in on the chat, James, um, yeah. from Am Jemison, um, wondering, do you work with organizations all over the UK or, you know, are you or, or what, you yes. know, what's the geographical kind of spread and focus of what um, you do? It's all over the UK. Most of it is England, not deliberately, but most, you know, probably 80% or so is, is England. Uh, we'd like to be more in Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. Um, so we're keen to expand there. Uh, we don't do international yet. We're, we're just too small. Yeah. Okay. But watch this space, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> 
And, you know, there's a lot of um, other, I suppose, diverse or claiming to be diverse job boards out there, um, James. Yeah. Um, so in your opinion, what makes Bridge of Hope different from from them, from those other entities? Yeah, I, I think that um, and I'm certainly not knocking any of them. And probably the, the, was some of them are very specialist. So there's a, you know, there's a very good one, for example, if you're looking at disability, we would recommend, you know, just um, even break, for example, a very good. There's other specialist ones like a veteran, veterans only or ex-offenders only. So if, if, if there's a certain talent pool you're interested in, they're specialists there, um, they're great. Um, there's also others probably might be more interested in trying to help people go into a particular sector. So there's one, for example, that focuses on hospitality sector uh, and they help you know um, homeless people get into hospitality so i suppose what we're trying to do is 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 aggregate the best talent um from across all sectors so we want to try and make it fully inclusive uh, but the key the key bit is the referral piece really um and the support and i think and chance will be able to tell you a little bit about the journey as well uh in a moment but you know what we don't do is algorithms where we go and find on Indeed or CV Library people who happen to check a certain box and plonk them on our system. Um, and there there are a few diverse job boards that do that. And um, so it, it's it's much more human based and it's supported by wonderful organizations. And then we actually we haven't got to that stage yet. When we do get to profit, we will be sharing some of our profits with our partners as well. So we're trying to create much more of a, an ecosystem, um, a holistic one where not only do the charities win, because um, every person they put into work is worth 18,000 pounds of social value. The candidates obviously hugely win um, and the employers win and, and we yeah. win to be able, and, and can scale accordingly. Yeah, and it's a sustainable, yeah. a sustainable thing. Great. What I'd just like to do before we um, we delve in a little bit more, uh, I'll come back to you, Chance, around, you know, the work you do specifically, is just to pick up again on, um, I suppose, what inclusive recruitment is all about. So, we, you know, I left this looking at the market and um, hopefully you can see my screen now and the slides again. Um, but I'd like to talk about inclusive recruitment and some of the barriers that might exist um, that for applicants um, looking to join organizations. And, and in my mind and how, how we operate is inclusive recruitment is really just recruitment done well, and doing the basics well. But the starting point for that is having a focus on attempting to screen people in rather than out at the first hurdle. If you're trying to be as open as possible and you're trying to uh, ensure that your application journey, your candid application journey um, is as open and speedy and efficient as possible. That's a very good place to start. So in terms of that candidate application journey, it does all start there. Um, and it starts with, you know, reviewing that journey to ensure there aren't any unintentional roadblocks or irrelevant barriers to entry. So one of those may be, um, you know, are there having a review and looking at are there non-job or skill related barriers that actually are irrelevant and could we do away with those? So are they not really serving a purpose? And, and if that's the case, then clearly that needs to change. Um, the next thing is, you know, this is a challenging one, but making sure that your screening isn't overly compliance driven. So what I mean by that is, uh, completely aware we work with many organizations that there's a statutory requirement for much of the pre-employment screening that they do with regard, regard to the applicants they're considering. However, it's breaking it down and saying, is it still fit for purpose? What value are we getting from that? And do we really need it? Now, of course, if the answers are from a legal statutory perspective, we do, of course, you've got to continue with that. But it's it's paring it down and making it as um, as efficient, as I say, as possible. Next thing uh, kind of tied into that is, you know, there are many organisations that have standard application forms and standard technical tests that possibly have been in place for quite some time. And, you know, um, are they really fit for purpose now? Or are they relevant anymore? How are they actually used in the in the recruitment process, if at all? If it's just to, to capture that data that you may use at another stage, then is there a better time to do that? And, and you know, 
when we're talking about a backdrop of 1.25 million vacancies and a, a, and a real challenge in terms of availability of candidates, these hurdles initially can really put people off. Uh, I've had a conversation with a candidate already this week who pulled out of a process, really loved the organisation, but the whole um, part of that process, which was part of the application form, is going to take an hour. And that individual had six other um, possibilities so they didn't you know whilst they were really interested that you know this was just too much time because they were they had other things going on with regard to work and, and family life and they, and they couldn't do that so I think it's just making sure is it relevant and, and what are we doing with this this information is your process going to challenge neurodiverse candidates and if so, you know, is there a way of of um, of changing that so that you can reach out to as many neurodiverse candidates as possible, particularly if that process or you know th there isn't a requirement really for that skill set in the job? Why are you why are you testing it perhaps in within the the screening process? And you know, I think the key thing here is. Um, Overall, is that candidate application journey as inclusive as it could be and as as efficient as it, as it could be? This is not about lowering the bar for less um, qualified candidates or applicants, but it's about making sure that you can confidently look at it and feel like, OK, it's efficient, it's inclusive, and we aren't blocking individuals who could really add value to our organisation um, and, you know, and, and the final one for me would be, and this happens a lot, you know, making sure that there aren't any perhaps hiring managers or people in the process going a little rogue and adding in extra stages and processes at the last moment. Because again, there will be fallout from that and candidates will just fall away, particularly if they were told this is the process and then there's something extra to do. So those are some of the blockers that, you know, I just wanted to discuss and and, and have out there in terms of, um, our conversation this morning. And I'd like to come back to you, Chance, if I may. Um, in terms of barriers to entry and some of the roadblocks, perhaps, you know, I've mentioned, but there are there are obviously many more that we've discussed candidates can face when applying to um, organisations. What is your advice? Because you work uh, with people every day trying to get them back and get them job ready and into um the employment market. What's your advice to employers looking to reach more um, diverse talent pools with regard to blockers that they may have in place? Chance, sorry, you're on mute again. <laughs> yeah, I think one of the uh, most important things is to actually just let your um, use your cu curiosity a, a bit. And you know, when it says uh, looked at the words of screen in rather than screen out, I always say to stop recruiting and start changing lives. If you do that, the interview questions will change. You'll then be looking for resilience. You'll be looking for that grit and you'll be looking for ways of how you can actually support this diamond in the rough. Um, you know, because it's pressure that makes the diamond, right? It's pressure that has made um, system impacted candidates so resilient. You know, and all you need to do is just polish them a little bit and they will sparkle you know, in, in, in the same way that I have, you know, but we have a we have a, a sourcing license as well, for instance, you know, which is a great way to actually bypass some of the barriers. You can actually use our sourcing license, go into the database. And, you know, if you're looking for, you know, first in family grads in Norwich, for instance, you could tap a couple on the shoulder and invite them in. Um, and not necessarily, I, I, the word interview, you know, I think, do you know what? Invite them in for a chat and then you'll hear more about them. And also when you look at and, and it's different things for different talent pools, you know, I mean, there's some barriers that refugees face, um, you know, because it, it might take them quite some time to get their paper, paper, papers in place and to, to work legal in the country. That that amount of time will then put a massive gap on the CV and then they won't even make it to to interview so it's it's it, and and also and and some and and particularly with refugees there's some highly qualified candidates there highly qualified um but a lot of them can't prove that because when the bombs were dropping 
the last thing on their mind was let me run and grab that master's certificate. You know, it was get the kids, get some food, get what you need and get out. And so there's so many uh, different things. So I think like with refugees, for instance, I think it's about actually if someone says I'm an expert in a field, it's worth actually getting them in for a couple of weeks, you know, and letting that unfold in front of you. You know, otherwise, again, you're missing out on some incredible talent. You know, um, people with neurodiversities, you know, I'm 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 dyslexic, for instance. And um, and so. Uh, like long sort of, you know, like ads for, for jobs, it can it can be a bit 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 much. Um, but, you know, so think about um, what your ad looks like. Is it talking more about this is a great place to work as opposed to, you know, here's all these different criterias. And so, you know, we know that, you know, like Richard Branson is dyslexic, you know, Whoopi Goldberg, Orlando Bloom, you know, Thomas Edison, you know, like some, inc I can go on, you know, about yeah. 20 names, um, incredible people. And do we really want to be that person that says, look, um, this is Richard Branson now, we could have hired him, you know, kind of thing, um, and end up, um, and so what we're essentially doing at, at the moment, we're being the guy that didn't sign the Beatles, you know, yeah. And so there's all these incredible talents, there's different ways and thinking about it in such a creative way um, is really important, very, very important. And to recognise those barriers, but also recognise our own unconscious biases as well. We all have them, I have, them. everyone has them and we should stop feeling guilty for them as well because it's not our fault. We get them from our childhood histories, our, our, our childhood timelines. We get them from media, TV, the whole thing. You know, it's just now we are aware, are aware of it. It's time to just review yourself, you know. And yeah. um, do, do you mind if I just give you a little example of a... Yeah, go for it, please, Chance, yeah. A, a friend of mine, I was walking down the road and a friend, I, I was with a friend and... And there was a bunch of uh, like about seven or eight African guys that was all talking at the same time, very loud because that's the culture. And uh, a friend of mine said, my God, how could they even understand what each other's saying and all of this? And I said, you know, that, that's what you see. Um, but what I see is something more genius than that. They clearly understand what each other's saying. They're able to have this type of communication all at the same time and very loud. Um, and they're clearly enjoying themselves. And so I said to him, if you saw the exact same thing in the stock market, would you say the same thing? You know, you'd say, you know, look at the go-getters. These are the guys with the Ferraris, you know, type of thing. When they are doing exactly the same thing. And so we all have these unconscious biases. So we need to actually really just think about those whilst we're uh, bringing people through into the recruitment pro process, you yeah. know, to, to allow a clearer pathway. Agree. Thank you, Chance. I think that's a really good point. Um, James, I'm just going to pick up on a question that's come in, if that's OK, uh, and I'll put this to you. Uh, it's come from uh, Tracy Hindley, and we have recently signed up the Disability Confidence Scheme to encourage those who may have a disability to apply to their organisation, I presume. Is there a scheme, this is probably a big ask, is there a scheme that looks at more diverse talent pools that fits your vision? And given that we're talking across the board, that's probably, you know, uh, but what's, what's your response to that, James? Um, well, well, first of all, just to apologise, um, I had a power cut. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I lost for five minutes, would you believe it? Um, and now I'm on on my phone's internet. So if I start go wobbly, um, bear with me. Well, we can we um, can hear you, James. So that's all that matters. <laughs> OK, yeah, of all the days, uh, <laughs> I couldn't make it up. Um, so I think the closest one, actually, uh, the business and the community um, just launched a fantastic campaign uh, called Opening Doors, I believe it is. Um, and that was about two months ago. And that was all around uh, inclusive uh, employment. Um, Chance, you probably can add a little bit more because you were you, you hosted one of their uh, their talks um, about a month or so when they were launching it. Do you, can you hear me OK? Yeah. yeah. I, I, Business and community chance. I think you were at a talk about a month ago uh, and they launched a scheme, um, business in the community scheme. Um, do, can you tell us any more about that on the back of 
you know the launch you attended oh sorry i'm 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 just slightly confused by this because i've been to, i've been to about 17 different uh, launches and don't so worry i tell you what we'll do what we'll do for tracy's benefit and for others is we'll dig out some information around that business and community. I know you do a lot, Chance, so you're you're always on stage with somebody launching something. Um, so we'll send that round with the notes at the end of of the event. That one specifically, because I know it can be. So we'll 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 do that. Um, we'll do that. Um, James, if I could come back to you, we can hear you, so don't worry. Uh, we may not be able to see, you, but we can definitely hear you. So and you're powerful. We didn't even notice. So there you go. Don't worry. It's all fine. Um. Can you talk us through um, the actual product that Bridge of Hope Careers is in terms of how you engage with employers and what type of clients you're already working with? Because it's a big list, isn't it? Yeah. Oh, thank you. Uh, yeah. So we, we try to keep it super simple. Um, we effectively have two products. Uh, one is a subscription uh, for clients, and that is a job posting subscription, and it's unlimited. So you could post as many jobs as you like. We'll do an API to you. You know, I think we're we're testing with Tesco at the moment with, you know, several thousand jobs at a time is not a problem. Uh, and you can effectively hire as many people as you like through that. And we want you, the whole point is we want you to hire as many as you possibly can. Um, and so that's product A, product B, and the two go hand in hand is a candidate sourcing license. So rather than uh, promoting the job and hoping people come to you, you do the other way around. Uh, so you go into our platform and we've got of the 75,000, 55 have got a thousand have got a can, uh, CV and you can go in and you might be looking for first in family graduates in Bournemouth and you might see 25 and talk to 20. And if you wanted to hire all 20, go for it. We want you to hire as many as you can. Uh, so that allows you to effectively cherry pick um, from our, our talent pool. So the two, the two go hand in hand. As far as um, types of employer, um, we made a decision fairly early on just to focus on larger blue chip uh, employers. Two reasons, one of which we want to make sure our candidates go to a really good home uh, and that you know we will actually turn employers down if we don't think there's a genuine commitment. They don't have to be great at DNI, but if there's not a commitment or a good place to go, we'll turn them down. Um, and partly because we're too small to work with the little guys. Um, and then we uh, so. Employers include anything from, you know, Direct Line, Santander, uh, Royal Ma Royal Navy, um, Cognizant, Waitrose, um, you know, it's it, body, body Shop. It's, it, you know, it's great. We're very excited because we've only been commercial for seven or eight months. Uh, and then we work with um, lots of agencies as well. And we're thrilled to say that one of them is called Morgan Hunt. <laughs> yes, indeed. And we're about, uh, we're in process with uh, one of uh, a potential candidate to join our recruitment team. Uh, through our partnership with Bridge of Hope Careers. So we're looking forward to that and first of many, hopefully. Uh, there is a question in the chat um, from Ashton Turner um, asking, are there any diversity focused job boards that you would recommend partnering with also? Well, I think we've hopefully answered that question. Bridge of Hope Careers would be the, the portal, I'm guessing. Chance and James, you would recommend. I would, I would, I would add, um, if you want to specifically focus on disability, uh, I would add Eden Break. Yeah, uh, and they're very good. Very good. Yeah. Fab. And what we'll do, like I said, with the uh, business and community information, I can circulate that with our notes uh, uh, after our event so people can have more information on that. So, Chance, coming back to you, I know that you work with partners uh, to help people on their journey into employment. That's one of the big focuses of your job on a day to day basis. So, how important is that work in terms of making sure that people stay at work once they've managed to find an opportunity? So I'm guessing getting them the job, that's great, but it's now, you know, ensuring that they that they will they will stick. Yeah, well, it, it, if, I, if I'm honest, um, candidates who um, are system impacted and face barriers, um, James was right at the beginning, you know, when they actually get a job, they stay. Retention is fantastic. It's um, it's just they be, they're so loyal and grateful, and they do they do work harder. But you know, when I came into Bridge Room, and James and I had look at it, and yes, indeed, the charities they have a duty of care, and they take you know we are we ask them to even continue that whilst they're in employment, and so they're supported by um, the charities up to a year while whilst in employment. But what what we've done, we've we've created what we call 
the coalition of skills and support partners in order to um, ensure that that journey across that bridge is as nourishing as it possibly could be with lots of support, important support. You know, so as an example, one of the stalls um, in the coalition are, are, are on the bridge um, will allow uh, for, for candidates who are ambivalent and unsure of what industries they want to work in. They can tap in some details, work history or not, and that um, will give them back a list of industries those skills are transferable to. We then have another stall um, to follow that, which uh, is partnered with the city and guilds who will then offer them free qualifications whether it be in tech or construction or, or, or whatever, um, and some career pathways into hospitality um, come next. But there were two that were really important um, to, uh, to us, and, and that was the financial support. And so there is a system on, on one of the stores where a candidate, our candidates can access their wages before payday. So um, once the employee signs up, um, if that candidate worked for two weeks, they can access two weeks of wages. Why is this important? This is important because it doesn't matter who you are. When you go into a new job, you're out of your comfort zone. And if you're experiencing any social anxieties or you've been out of employment for quite some time because you've been struggling to get in, um, a utility bill coming in whilst you're working your month in hand can raise your levels of anxiety. You know, especially when you're trying to prove yourself. And so um, we want to alleviate that. Um, so so allowing the, the, the candidate to just access part of their wages, pay that bill and carry on down the good path. And then the other um, stall, um, it offers free financial advice to the candidate. But they don't stop there. They offer it to the whole family. And this was um, while, whilst I was negotiating this particular um, stall, um, I was going through some stuff myself. Um, I've been taking care of my mom through the whole of lockdown and she's very proud and she, you know, she wouldn't, I had no idea that she had um, some debts until I went through some letters and found and found out. And then um, I was, I found myself paying bills for two houses and, and it was struggle. So I took advantage of this particular stall myself and within six weeks, all those um, debts were sorted and were being serviced and um, mum uh, got some extra money coming in uh, for, for stuff that she did. She had no idea she was entitled to at her age. And, um, and now she's got even a little bit of extra cash to buy the grandchildren some ice cream, although they want trainers. Yeah. And, um, and, and so this, this was fantastic. And I thought this is brilliant because this is going to be fantastic for our first in family grads. Um, because if you're the one in your family that got a degree, and your first in family. It's not just you that got a degree. The whole family just got a degree, you know, and you, I even had a couple of cousins celebrating that I don't even talk too much. Um, but they they all seem to want to benefit like a natural instinct to, to benefit from from this. So whoever's got the earning power and, and stuff like this. And so they all come to you whenever they have financial problems. And it's an absolute privilege to be in a position that you can support mum and support family, but it's a real weight on your shoulders um, when you're taking it taking it all on, and you get recommended by other family members. You know, say oh, I've got money, but they say C chance, and you know, and so this was really important. Um, so our now our candidates, and um, particularly our, we work with 20, 25 um, universities. So, so those candidates, when they are asked, can you help me with this financial problem? They say absolutely. They will then introduce them to um, this particular stall and they will get a, the family member will get a phone call directly and supported directly, which then takes that stress and, and burden <laughs> off of the candidate's shoulders so they can continue to thrive in the workplace. And so we've created this um, just, you know, to, to have that added um, support you know and not that they need it these candidates um you know people are system impacted we have somehow replaced motivation with determination i'm not mo i don't need motivating and many of the candidates the one that's um just um come over to, to morgan hunt 
doesn't need motivating. The determination is so clear. The determination yeah. to do well is so clear. So um, keeping the keeping them in the workplace is not at all. Or no, at all. but it's those practical things that you've just spelt out that yeah. uh, I think if we like James, you, you'd, you'd admit, you know, being born lucky when you have access, you have support around you and you have a network. Uh, you might not think about, whereas actual individuals who haven't been born into that environment absolutely need it. And it's just making sure that, you know, those extra uh, uh, structural, practical supports are there. So that makes complete sense. And just a quick um, follow up on that chance um, for employers who hire. So for us, Morgan Hunt, we're going to hopefully imply, um, um, sorry, hire a number of people through Bridge of Hope Careers. Um, what extra, um, what, in, what do we need to do to ensure we retain that talent? So just a tip on that extra support that perhaps as an employer, duty of care that we would need to, to, to be aware of for those individuals. Yeah, I think, I think it's just really important to um, spend some time with that individual and make them actually feel really valued because that's one of the things that makes people really feel great in the workplace. Um, you know, it, going into a, a workplace where, you know, you don't feel as though anyone's gravitating towards you and things like this, you know, it, it can sort of affect the level of self-esteem, which has already you know, been sort of tampered with uh, uh, along the journey. But I think that's one of the, 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 the most important things. And actually look for even look for some mentorship from that candidate, because there will be a lot to learn from that candidate about themselves, about their culture. And, and, and that's really going to help in shifting the organisational culture in a more diverse direction. That's a great point, because also if you can learn from them, you know, the hurdles they've had to overcome as an organisation and few hiring manager, you can be more aware, aware of those next time. And it's less of a, of a challenge. I am aware, guys, we've got a lot to talk about and we've only got five minutes left. So, James, I was going to come back to you and just ask you um, if there are some um, briefly some key examples of best practice employers who are accessing talent pools via Bridge of Hope careers um, that their competitors aren't even thinking about. Um, and, you know, uh, who are those employers who are, who are doing this really well? Have you got maybe an example of one or two? Uh, absolutely. I mean, I think the sort of the poster child is Timpsons. Um, and I think probably most people know that. And they're, we're thrilled to have them as one of our partners. Um, and Timpsons, um, you know, they, they actively hire from the ex-offender community, something like 10% of their employees, um, maybe even more than that, come from that particular community. Uh, it's been hugely successful to them. They found it a massive competitive advantage. They've sourced an awful lot of talent from there. They haven't had any issues. Uh, the first thing they do is they give people when they've been trained in the prison uh, and they come out, they give them the job. And the first day they say is they're the takings, take them to Barclays. And some of these people look and say, you do realize I was an armed robber. And they're like, hurry up because it's closing in 15 minutes and, and nobody's run away with the, the money. And so, you know, they, they've been spectacularly successful and they're creating a much broader <clears throat> program around that as well. Um, but another one which I, I thought would be worth mentioning, um, and they're actually one of our um, a partner as well, called Recycling Lives. Um, and um, not many people have heard of them. And they're a small little recycling business up in the Northwest. Uh, and then they've kind of expanded and got bigger and bigger. And um, they once they got bigger, they decided we ought to do a little bit more uh, to give back. Um, and they decided they wanted to try and help people in the local area. Um, and they picked people up who basically were homeless in sort of Preston area or beyond a bit beyond that. And, and kind of they checked them out, basically said, look, do you want another Carlsberg or do you want another crack at life? And if it was the first, they give them another can. And if it was the second, they give them uh, an opportunity to get into their program um, to kind of get back on their feet. So they did the rehabilitation bit got them job ready, and then they offered them a job. Um, and um, these people proved to be exceptionally successful. Uh, and, and when I talked to the CEO and I said, you know, what were the biggest wins of this kind of thing? And he said, oh, well, you know, where do I start? But he said, I suppose there are three that really kind of blew us away. One of which is productivity wise, you know, not only did they come in and work harder than everybody else, but everybody else had to work hard to keep up with them. So our overall productivity went through the roof. And he said, well, second one was uh, retention, touched on, touched on this by chance. 
He said, we don't have a word called retention in our, our business because, frankly, nobody leaves. It, you know, it just, just glued the whole organization down, which is amazing. Uh, and he said, but believe it or not, those are not the two biggest benefits. And I said, well, I can't think of a better one than either of those. And he goes, well, actually, uh, it's um, winning new business. Uh, and he said, so, you know, their strategy to win new business is when they're pitching for TV recycling in Wandsworth or whatever it might be, or Birmingham, everybody else is quoting by the ton. And he says, look, take ton, 10 tons and we'll put one homeless person into work and take 50 and we'll put 10 people into work. He says, we win every one. <laughs> and I said, well, what's your pricing? He goes, oh, we're more expensive than all the others. So, um, you know, you can actually turn this. And that's what yeah. we're trying to do is say, look, don't think this is altruistic. Think of this as a, a commercially smart thing to do where everybody wins. But obviously, huge beneficiaries are the individual at the end of it and their family. Um, yes. But it is a really good commercial decision as well. Completely agree. Yep. Makes complete. That's the business case, isn't it, yeah. that we were talking about? Thank you, James. Um, I have had a, um, a question from uh, a James Fox just asking about the costs of products uh, with Bridge of Hope Careers. So I wonder, James, um, what we'll do is, again, give your contact details and they can contact you directly yeah. uh, afterwards to have a conversation a back and forth, even on LinkedIn, send you a message or whatever. And I'd like to just quickly finish. We've got a minute. And it was one thing that we touched on earlier. And Chance, I think it's a, ni a nice way to finish because you're an example of this. But very briefly, um, you know, you talk a lot about the grit and resilience of the many candidates that you work with and you've shown it yourself. Um, so, you know, what do those people, what does that grit and resilience in, in, a, in a couple of lines, what does that grit and resilience give to a potential employer um, from these unique candidates, in your opinion? Oh, you can put any task in in in, in front of this the, these candidates. They they will continue all the pressure. You could be going through the most pressurizing phase of a business. They're the ones that are going to stand there and continue with you. And be, and it's and it's a piece of cake because we're used to that sort of pressure. It's become normal. And so there's real benefits to that. And, you know, whether you're introducing a new concept or a new um, department and there's a whole bunch of stuff, it's that sort of being able to just glide through all those things that would make average people quite stressed out. Um, yeah. It's it's really good. And they keep that sense of calm and keep it keeps everyone else sort of calm. <laughs>